Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. I have always been fascinated by plants and nature. Growing up, I spent countless hours in the garden with my mother, learning about different flowers, trees, and shrubs. It was no surprise that I eventually pursued a degree in botany, hoping to understand the intricate relationships between plants and their environment. During my junior year of college, I was given an opportunity to intern at Bohemian Grove in partnership with the U.S. Department of Interior. Despite the rumors and conspiracy theories surrounding the place, I was excited to be a part of the team that would catalog the existing species of plants on site. It was a valuable study that would help maintain their federal funding, and I was more than happy to contribute. Upon arriving at the grove, I couldn't help but notice the cold spot that seemed to appear out of nowhere. It was strange, to say the least. I was used to working outdoors, but this was something entirely different. You could be walking in 80-degree weather and then suddenly feel a pocket of cold air envelop you. As I went about my work, I started to notice something else something that I couldn't quite explain. At first, I thought I was imagining things, but as time went on, I became more and more convinced that there was something there. I called them the men of the garden and trees, although I knew that was far from an accurate description. They were enormous, hairy creatures, unlike anything I'd ever seen before. The first time I saw one, it appeared out of nowhere and grabbed a bag of bird food from behind the work shed. I couldn't believe my eyes. This was not human, and yet it was here, right in front of me. I didn't know what to make of it, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to this place than met the eye. I asked one of the groundskeepers if he had seen anything strange, and he confirmed my suspicions. He called them giants, who hide in other dimensions, but he didn't seem alarmed. To him, they were just another part of the landscape, like the trees and the birds. A week later, they built a temple with old-school Greek columns in the area, and that's when things got even weirder. I looked up and saw a shimmering light, and there it was, one of the giants staring back at me with its piercing eyes. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before, and yet it felt strangely familiar. Over the next three months, I saw them 14 times. Each time, it was like a jolt to my system. I knew that people wouldn't believe me if I told them what I had seen, but it didn't matter. I had seen something that had changed me forever. The world was no longer the same after that. On to the next one. My name is Clara, and I'm writing to you from Vancouver Island. I want to tell you a story about something that happened to me in 1989. I had just turned 18 years old. While I sit here thinking about where to start, I can't help but notice how happy I am to be here still. I believe there was a long period where I subconsciously tried to disregard how lucky I was to escape the clutches of a human-like animal that was probably at least 20 times as strong as me. It was around 6.30 in the evening when I was walking home from a house that my boss, Mrs. Ferris, had rented for work. She was a photographer who hired me to be her assistant for the summer. Although happy to have the money, I secretly loathed the job. The woman was obnoxious, particular about everything. I wanted to quit after the first few days of working for her, 
but I didn't want to embarrass my parents, for Mrs. Ferris was their close friend. I wouldn't say she was nasty, but her ego was one of the most noticeable I'd ever encountered. I often sensed that she felt her art was larger than life, but I suppose there is a chance I'm being hypercritical. Maybe she was just extremely passionate, which I might have appreciated a little more had I been able to look at it differently. I probably wasn't in much of a place to judge anyone. Of course, I didn't know it then, but I was an entitled teenager. I was the type who usually came off as shy, but would throw an internal fit when things didn't go my way. On the day of the event, I felt particularly annoyed by how work had gone. Mrs. Ferris had rented an incomprehensibly beautiful ranch, but every object in each frame had to be situated in the most precise locations. I had to rearrange everything before she would snap that darn camera. I was exhausted as I rode my bike home along the gravelly dirt road to the property. I recall it was pretty humid that day which made the unbalanced bike ride more of a pain in the bum. For whatever reason, Mrs. Ferris made me lug a bunch of her equipment inside a heavy-duty, extremely padded backpack. You know, the more I think about this now, the more apparent it is that that woman had a superiority complex. It was like she got off by watching others exhaust themselves over her projects. She had her husband with her on the day of the encounter, and I was so surprised to watch her give him basically the same treatment she would give me. It was almost humorous, because he didn't at all look like the type who would appreciate receiving commands like that, but as far as I saw, he always did as she told him without complaining. Something about seeing all of that put me into a lousy mood. I specifically recall how I was halfway up the mile-long driveway when I saw what I initially thought was a man getting harassed by a pack of coyotes. Aside from the weirdness of the interaction, I wondered how this individual could stand wearing a fur coat in humid weather. The group was just outside the wood line, maybe 200 yards from the fence to my right, since it was immediately one of the strangest scenes I had ever seen. I stopped pedaling to take a brief break and better understand what was happening. The strange gang noticed my presence only a few moments after I stopped. Even most of the coyotes turned to face me. And it wasn't long after that I realized the individual beside them wasn't human. It got down on all fours and began charging towards me at a jogging speed. Although I was creeped out by what I was seeing, it must have been the confusion that prevented me from pedaling away as soon as I should have. My mind was too busy trying to analyze something so unlike anything I'd ever seen, even in the movies or TV. I recall wondering if this thing coming my way was an overgrown coyote that happened to have trotted in a bipedal stance for a brief moment when I looked in that direction. I also think it took me a while to get going because I wondered which direction I should go. Should I go toward the road leading into my house or head back toward the ranch and hope to get my boss and her husband to help protect me from this thing? If you've dealt with a scenario like mine, you'll probably know what I mean by how difficult it was to apply logic. It was as if everything about the circumstance froze me while I tried to ascertain what exactly was happening. Surprisingly, it wasn't until the human-like creature was within maybe 20 yards of me that I finally decided to leave. I pedaled in the direction of my house, since that's where I was already facing, and it seemed like any further delay could get me into a boatload of trouble. To lighten my load and pedal faster, I dropped the bag full of equipment onto the driveway. I figured my boss would understand, given I was trying to save my life. Once I had made it about 40 yards away from where I saw the beast, I looked over my shoulder, hoping it had stopped near the fence. Embarrassingly, I started peeing my pants when I saw that it was still following me, 
However, this time it moved on two feet. Stay away from me, I shouted as if the creature understood. One of the strangest aspects of this encounter was how drool fell out of its mouth in every direction. It reminded me of what you see with pit bulls, English bulldogs, and other breeds like those. It made things even more frightening than they already were. I must have shouted at him to leave me alone 10 or 20 times while I rode my bike along that gravelly driveway, but none of it discouraged it from continuing toward me. I almost couldn't believe it when the main road appeared up ahead and a pickup truck towing a trailer containing a horse had just turned into the driveway and was coming toward me. Stop, stop your car, I yelled while waving one hand in the air. The driver slammed on the brakes and waited for me to arrive at the window. I hopped off my bicycle and ripped the door open, probably nearly tearing it from the hinges. I have never been anywhere near as desperate to get inside anything in my life. What was that thing? The female driver asked. She wore a cowboy hat and appeared in her mid to late forties. I looked through the windshield and saw that the human-like animal was nowhere in sight, but the woman confirmed she had glimpsed it before it disappeared. Her eyes gave away that she had never seen anything like that thing. There was no trace of the human-like creature or the coyotes when we drove past the area I first spotted them. I never saw another beast like it, and I stopped working for Mrs. Ferris after that terrifying evening. My father ended up being the one to convince me that I had encountered a Sasquatch. I appreciate how he seemed to genuinely believe me, for I know many people who have seen these creatures struggle with those close to them not buying their story. On to the next one. This encounter happened when I was a child. Growing up, I spent a lot of time with my grandma. She had only one rule. Be home by dark or a whipping was coming. I had several cousins that stayed there also. We loved her and knew she loved us. We were always outside playing in the hills. No shoes and no shirt was the norm. How we never got a snake bite is beyond me. When cold weather set in, we still got to go in the hills, but it was going hunting we enjoyed the most. Fox hunting, to be exact. My Uncle John was blind, but knew the hollow and surrounding hills intimately. It was amazing to watch him, always knowing where certain landmarks were and which way to go. When hunting, he would let us lead the dogs on chains to where we always camped. One occasion, as we were going across the jockey ground, a place people got together and traded livestock, horses, guns, knives, and, well, you get the picture. The dogs began acting up. They barked and growled. They pulled on the lead. They never done this, but it was unnerving. If you know foxhounds, you know they're quite mean. My uncle tried to calm them, as we held on to the chains, the dogs changed their demeanor and began to whimper and gather around Uncle John. As we tried to keep them from wrapping him up, my cousin Stevie said to look up at the rock slide against the bank. We were more concerned with the chains and my uncle's continuing demands to the dogs to stop. My cousin stated again and again to look, and when some of us did, there was nothing. Uncle John asked what he had seen, and Stevie said it was a huge, hairy monster that was laid across the rock watching them. Just then, the dogs began to act normal, and we continued with the hunt. We sat around the fire that night on top of the big knob, listening to the dogs running fox until sleep overcame us. Morning found us calling the dogs in and heading to Grandma's. The trip comes up in conversation now and again, with Stevie saying it was a Bigfoot he saw then. This happened in the hills of Kentucky, and I still experience things in the woods. I know it's here, and it sure gets scary at night sometimes, but I will always go into the woods. On to the next one. Near Fulton in Kalamazoo County in Michigan, I've had more than one encounter with Bigfoot or something. The incident I'm going to describe here is just one of the countless I have had. It was late, midnight or so. I was camping in a swamp with a friend of mine. We both have been to the campsite before, 
It's near where I grew up, deep in the center of this large forest. Mostly swamp, but the edges of the forest is hardwood. They logged it out some years back, and there are many treetops and fallen trees in the center. Swampy area, almost bog-like. You could walk for miles on just downed trees. We crossed darn near the whole place like that on one of our excursions out there. Anyway, the campsite is on this stream. Bear Creek is what we have always called it. There was a big bend in it and some of the only high ground in the immediate area. There were two huge old trees right there also. We had a small fire going and were sitting around talking quietly. I grew up with this guy and the two of us have camped regularly since we were young. The night was normal. In the sense of animal sounds and such, I heard it first, if I remember right. It was coming down the creek from the south. You could just make out the footfalls, though through this point, I should add, there are many deer trails. The main one follows the creek, and there is one that comes in from the east, which is woods and swamp. This spot was just one of many on the creek that had a major crossing point for deer. We have had more than one come through the camp early in the morning and cross there. It came closer, about 30 yards or so, and that is when it went off. Points of note. I did have a 12 gauge with me, and this was the last time I took it out camping there again. We had knives also. It started to scream, howl, vocalize at us, and while it was doing this, it proceeded to tear up a tree. I could not locate exactly which tree it was in that early morning. It went on like this for some time. I grabbed my gun and loaded it. My friend told me to quit freaking out and said he was going to talk to it, and he did. He went into the woods about 10 feet or more beyond the campfire and stood out there. I could barely see him in the darkness. It was early spring at this time. This went on for a bit more, a few minutes or so, and then stopped. I heard nothing more, no movement, nothing. It just went away. We have tagged this thing with the name Monkey Beast, for that was our first thought that some strange monkey was out in the woods with us. Note, I never shot my gun, nor did I raise it or level it toward the sound. The night was clear. I'm going to place my bet that we were right on one of the main runways that it traveled. I deduce this from the other incident that have happened at the exact spot. Stuff has happened there, like this about eight or nine times with a witness every time, but only one. If there was more than one, we did not hear it or see anything. But I would guess that there were a lot more noise, too, at those times. We have camped at that location for around five years, and in that area for eight or nine years. Why I never took a camera or a video recorder, tape recorder, I don't know. I've never found any tracks either, and I've spent some time looking. During this incident, we were around the ages of 16 or 17. Firelight, nighttime. The weather was nice for spring. The area is swamp and hardwood at the edges. The creek runs right through the middle of it. There are a lot of stories out there. I have seen this thing once, for sure, maybe twice, and heard it on 15 or so occasions. On to the next one. South of Mio in Osakota County in Michigan. Late at night, just before bedtime, while camping, it was extremely quiet. No hint of it approaching our camp. We all jumped up and it ran after a loud roar. I don't remember anything after that or even exchanging a story with my kids until recently. We still avoid talking about that night. I can't stop thinking about that night. It was an extremely loud roar. The trees on the trail 20 feet from sighting were twisted all along the trail. Two of the three witnesses saw the creature, and they all heard the loud scream. It was 11 p.m., calm and dry. On to the next one. This was near Evart in Osceola County in Michigan. This was the first time we saw it. It was in early November. My brother-in-law shot a deer while bow hunting. We waited until everyone was back in camp before our search for the deer. At that time, I could carry a handgun into the woods. We went out with a Coleman lantern for the search. 
We went back to the tree stand and looked for blood. We followed the trail, and it stopped. We looked around. Then we heard a noise that got our attention. I held the lantern high to see further with no avail. We heard footsteps pacing back and forth, heavy steps that had a lot of weight behind them, deliberate to get our attention. It did. We could barely make out the outline. It appeared to stand seven feet or so tall. I could not make out the features well. We believed that it took the deer and just wanted us to go away. Next, it made this guttural sound, a warning so it seemed. I never heard anything like it in the woods before. It's so hard to describe. We felt threatened, and I took out my handgun and said if it came into the light, I would use the pistol. Slowly, we backtracked out from the area and back to camp. On to the next one. Moving to this place on the Columbia River in Washington seemed like I had left all civilization. Moving here to begin with was a huge decision. I had made an agreement with my husband, Reuben, that I would give it one year. And he had written and signed the contract that stated, if after one year, Tara is not completely happy with living here, we will move to a state of her choosing. Since we married 32 years ago, I had long been away from my birthplace in Virginia, and I had rather enjoyed our home in Seattle, where we were both employed in the aircraft manufacturing industry. We had retired there, but Reuben had always had a true desire to return to his roots. He had been born and raised in a small town, the Dales, Oregon, and he kept trying to talk me into looking at moving anywhere near there. My having a retirement clause in a large investment that would cost me a penalty if I left the state of Washington, we agreed to a compromise and looked for a rural property on the Washington side of the Columbia River, and we lucked out in finding a newer home with an acreage that the seller agreed to allow us to rent for a year with the option to purchase at an exceptional price. His wife said she was sick of the rain, while we had become so used to it, so we grabbed the opportunity. The home is a mile or so from the Columbia River, and the house sat atop a rather large hill from which we could see the Columbia River, and we have a superb view of Oregon's Mount Hood from our large deck. I had to admit that it was strikingly beautiful, but I was afraid of being so remote. Vancouver, Washington, and Portland, Oregon were only an hour or so away, which brought about my agreeing to the deal. As civilization was at least close, we made the move, and I'll have to admit that the steam whistle from a passing ship gave me a fond memory of my childhood home. After we had settled in and made a few shopping trips, to the Portland malls, I was ready to be sold. So I told Reuben to start selling. We were soon carrying backpacks and heading out into the national forest that bordered our property line, and we found the beautiful forest were absolutely crisscrossed with hundreds of deer and elk trails. Since much of this area was a designated wilderness area, we had no intention of doing any shooting, but the handguns we carried were at the advice of the local rangers. When it came to the subject of Sasquatch, I'll admit to being highly skeptical. And Reuben had long ago ceased trying to convince me of their existence, but I had never bought into it. Now, however, when we had visited the local rangers, the subject had come up purely by accident, even though at first I thought that Rube had asked them to stage it for my benefit. A young couple was telling the rangers they had been chased by a Bigfoot, and they seemed sincere enough, but I was still suspicious until it was our turn at the counter. The ranger never even mentioned the creatures, and my curiosity forced me to address it. The man politely asked that if and when we should encounter one, to please quickly back away and not even attempt to approach it, as they were very docile until they sensed danger, and then he said, they think they're King Kong. That was enough for me, and as I had so easily accepted this as truth, I wondered why I had never before taken it seriously. 
we began making regular explorations into our property and gradually stretching out into different areas of the government land surrounding us until we had accumulated a collection of favorite routes throughout many miles of territory. And in all of those many miles, we had only once seen another human being. Reuben showed me why it made sense, but after the main road arrived at our property, it turned away sharply and went around the rugged rocks that bordered our hill, and when it once again curved back around, the distance to return near our land was about ten miles through rough terrain. I realized then why so few vehicles ever came anywhere near us except for forestry rigs. In our exploration, we had seen large numbers of elk, black-tailed deer, foxes, coyotes, all types of squirrels, ravens, crows, hawks, eagles, and so many species. I could not even begin to list every one of them. But I reminded Rube that I still had never seen one of his mythical Sasquatch. That must have triggered something in his nature, because on our very next outing, I got my proof in spades. We began venturing deeper into the forest with each trip, and gradually learning the fastest routes through the massive forest. During our exploration, we came across an increasing number of wolf tracks, and according to the rangers, there should have been only a few remaining. However, we identified two distinctly different, very large prints, and with the differences in the rest of the pack prints, there had to be two separate families of these wolves. There definitely was a sizable difference in the two adults in each of these packs. The coyotes were less than the rangers had suspicioned, but we felt it had to be because of the number of wolves. I was personally more afraid of the large cougar tracks, and one day when we ended up returning by our same route, we saw fresh tracks where a cougar had followed us. Finding cougar prints over our own tracks made only hours before was unnerving to say the least and I found my hand reaching back often to feel the reassuring grip of my handgun. Once, we came upon a cougar with a deer that it had recently killed, and instead of retreating, it just stood over the deer and snarled at us. The animal's teeth were enough to give me nightmares, and its snarl gave us all the reason in the world to back straight away. That blood-curdling scream echoing through the forest was further evident that the cougar did not wish to be disturbed any further. I experienced a rude awakening at that point because I always heard that all wild animals in our state automatically yielded their space before humans, but they must have forgotten to notify the cougars. We also saw a few bobcats, but they never remained in the view more than a few seconds before they disappeared. As we backed away, I noticed the revolver in Reuben's hand and I was reassured in my suspicion that the cougar was not about to back away. Perhaps it had little mouths to feed. Realizing it was no different than someone approaching me when I was loading groceries in the car at Walmart, I too would be alarmed and defensive. After all, we were interrupting the cougar's shopping trip and its meal. The early spring gave way to a beautiful summer. The small accumulation of snow was gone, and we were anxious to resume our exploring, and Reuben was still selling me on the property that he had very obviously fallen in love with. I remained passive, relishing in Reuben's effort to point out all the pluses for going ahead with purchasing this property. I, on the other hand, was still thinking that there were other more civilized places to live in the state. Our next adventure was one that we had both looked forward to but put off due to the early snowfall last year that would have caught us at too high an elevation to be safe. So now we were headed for the Ape Cave. I believe that it got its name from Guilford Pinchcott, who was President Theodore Roosevelt's Secretary of the Interior, and was also the President's brother-in-law, if my memory serves me right. Not that it matters, but it impressed me that such famous people were knowledgeable about this very spot. We had carefully planned this trip for a year, and all of our research indicated that the first visitors to this area were assaulted by huge apes that pelted them with stones and rolled large boulders down on them from the cliffs above. We certainly weren't afraid of any ape people still guarding the caves, however, 
the ranger cautioned us that there may have been a group of Sasquatch way back then, before anyone had ever heard about their existence, and they very easily could have descendants that exist to this very day. We appreciated their words of caution and the very real chance that there could be descendants of those mysterious apes, as the head ranger advised us. The attacks by apes had never been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, nor had they been disproven. Spring gradually gave way for our first forecast for clear weather ahead. So, having been befriended by a ranger, whom we allowed to have access to a large pond on our property for an experimental trout study, he accumulated a collection of old documents that all had individual reports from those who had documented their sightings and encounters since the very first sighting. He had been kind enough to make photocopies of them all, and he surprised us at our car, saying to please never reveal how we got them, and to please not share them with anyone. We knew he was taking a risk doing this, as the official policy of the department is one of total denial of the existence of any such creatures. So here we were, on our second day in the darkness of the thickly forested valley, and the day was beautiful, with that early morning chill languishing in the small meadows as we ate a cold breakfast and washed up in the ever-so-cold stream that crisscrossed throughout this forest of heavy ground moss, raggly spruce, and thick balsam trees. The trail was easy to follow thanks to our ranger friend having hand-drawn a shortcut that we would likely never have found, and we would have run up against a steep cliff that the map did not indicate. Had we gone the way shown on the map we had previously purchased, we would have missed the place we now were walking through, and having wasted so much time, we agreed that we probably never had tried again. What a loss that would have been. Our ranger friend had told us that their department had always known of this error, but he admitted to the fact that they all agreed to leave it as it was, as they had plenty of rescues to perform without expanding the area which would likely have tripled their workload. According to the hand-printed notation on our copied map, the pathway had been drawn in by hand, so we carefully wound our way around the trail according to the notations in ink. We had to be getting close. There was a notation in the text that one of their party had totally disappeared, and when searching the area, the group came upon a high ridge that was apparently formed by a volcanic explosion from one of the area's mountains that had suddenly appeared as a new peak that had just burst open. Spewing molten lava over this entire area and causing this resident ape family to flee for their lives. After the violent eruption, there remained an entire network of caves left as the lava cut its way through the molten rock and it flowed at a fast enough speed that it left a huge network of smooth-walled tube-like caves throughout a wide area. It was in those caves that these Bigfoot creatures made their homes. These stories and rumors of wild apes persisted over the years, and these wild tales of ape-like creatures served to be a catalyst for the government to post the entire area as an unsafe and off-limit. Numerous sightings and frightening encounters were reported and these reports fueled increasing visitors until the forestry people declared the entire area as being unsafe and off-limits to everyone. So, here we were, likely the first visitors to these caves for a long while, and as we placed our packs on a small ledge near the opening, we retrieved our flashlight and spare batteries, and after camouflaging our pack behind a large chunk of ceiling that had fallen, we entered the large cave directly off to the left side of the trail. Our eyes were fighting to adjust to the total darkness, and we gradually were able to walk more easily on the narrow center of the cave where eons of time had formed a flat area composed of the gradually deteriorating feeling of the lava tube we were traveling through. That made enough of a flat surface for comfortable walking. At one point, where we had decided it was late enough in the day to seek shelter for the night rather than return all the way to the entrance, we were discussing whether or not we could even keep from getting panicky, and since Reuben was in the lead, we took turns using one light at a time to conserve batteries. He turned off his light rather than being in total darkness, as we should have been, 
there seemed to be another light source coming from way up ahead. Taking enough time for our eyes to adjust, there was adequate light by which to see our way, but the first time Rube stumbled over a small piece of rock, the conservation idea was out. We continued for what must have been several hundred feet more, and suddenly there was a huge opening in the outer wall of the cave, through which we exited into the brilliant midday sun. We sat down on some boulders to give our eyes time again to adjust, and directly facing us, only thirty or so yards away, was another cave that, from where we sat, looked like a continuation of our same tunnel. We reasoned finally that we had been traveling through a volcanic lava tube that had run across the valley and gradually hardened to leave a long, winding tunnel that reminded me of a huge black garden hose winding across the open expanse of this valley from where we were now on the outside of the tube. It was easy to envision. The bright sky revealed that the open valley all around us was lush with vegetation, and the tall ponderosa pine trees grew across the area, and some were only yards away from where we were. We enjoyed a light snack, and the brilliant sky chased away the chill of the cave. We were contemplating a return to the tunnel to resume our exploring as we sat silently while leaning back against the incline of the rough lava when suddenly our world changed. I suspected that we both had fallen asleep in our comfortable rocky lounge when my senses made me open my eyes, not because of any noise, but more a feeling than anything else. I was too relaxed to do more than open my eyes thinking that I must subconsciously have awakened due to the loud screech of the hawk floating gracefully overhead, but my eyes detected a slight movement directly across from me. There, standing like a statue not forty feet away, stood a creature that I recognized instantly to be a Sasquatch. I found it funny that, in my stocked state, my mind projected a picture of me saying, Dr. Sasquatch, I presume? I still remember that strange thought, but thankfully, I hadn't even dared to take a breath. The animal was only about five feet tall with a slight slump to its shoulders, and as we stared at each other, it cocked its large head as if trying to discern what I was. Then a movement behind it caused me to sit up straight, as there, towering above the focus of my attention, was a monster. The adult seemed almost to touch the top of the opening, and all I could compare it to was the gorilla in the Portland Zoo only this animal was much larger. Rube was awake now, due to my gasp, but as he looked up, the adult must have sensed a threat, and the horrible screech it let out was, as Reuben later put it, enough to cause instant baldness. We were both wide awake, and even though we carried guns, we had never before drawn them for fear, yet here we stood, ready to defend ourselves against a behemoth. That, we later agreed, wouldn't have even likely felt pain before it tore us to shreds. Then, in a blink, both animals were gone. We stood there, visibly shaking, as we hoped to some day see a Sasquatch. But, with both of us having serious doubt, we were going through the motion in order to keep such a fascinating mystery alive. Our explorations were now cut short, as neither of us had any desire for further explorations of the remainder of this lava tube with what we knew was ahead of us, somewhere in the dark tube. We retraced our path out of the cave and walked at a much faster pace, without realizing it, until we came across our previous night's camp. It was only midday. We had not traveled all that far, but since we were both in a state of exhaustion, we made an early camp. Without speaking, we were each alone with our thoughts. When I noticed, Rube had withdrawn the roll of heavy twine that we had carried for emergency wrapping for splints and such, he was stringing the twine in a huge web all around the willows surrounding our campsite. Then he retrieved an empty can from our trash bag, placed several small stones in it, and added the can to the string between branches. Testing several places in the network of his alarm system, Reuben finally noticed me watching and said, Custom Sasquatch Detector. I know we both slept better that night. Leaving at daybreak the next morning, involved adding the alarm system to our carry-out trash collection, and a hasty breakfast, we made record time on our return, without the constant inspection of tracks on the trail, and we arrived home during dusk. Closing the door behind us was a great relief, and Rube said it. 
it made his butt pucker. Several statements that Reuben has made on our return trip were an obvious attempt at taking my temperature as I could tell that he feared our Sasquatch encounter may have swayed me against going through with purchasing this home. So at lunch on the patio, I calmly suggested that perhaps we should plant some apples and pear trees and a few Christmas trees for our later use. You could see the smile on his face all the way from Seattle. On to the next one. If you ever worry about being out in the wild and needing help, let me tell you, there's more out there than meets the eye. How do I know? Well, I learned through experience. A life and death experience. But fortunately, I had a rescuer. And a most unusual one, I'll add. One who probably knew more about medicinal plants than any other creature on Earth. Other than his or her own kin, that is. So, how did I end up out in the wild needing help? Well, it was an experience that taught me a number of things and basically changed my entire outlook about life in general. I was in my late 30s and had been working as a nurse practitioner out in the oil field. You have to study medicine for a long time to become a nurse practitioner, and you have many of the same responsibilities as an actual physician, including being able to prescribe medicine. You do have legal limitations on what you can do, but a lot of nurse practitioners actually know almost as much as a doctor and can diagnose things very well. You don't make as much as a doctor, but you do make really good money much more than a regular nurse in most cases. But I hadn't studied nursing to get rich. I don't think anyone does. Though I was making real good money at the time, especially working in the oil patch. Petroleum companies typically hire medical people to take care of their workers in some of the larger oil patch facilities. It's kind of being like a school nurse, in that you're on site and ready for accidents or whatever. A presence to make sure workers have medical care in case of emergency. Oil rigs and such can be dangerous places to work. I was the only medical person on staff at a large oil sands operation in Alberta at the time, and I'd accumulated an ungodly number of vacation days. My boss basically told me I needed to take them or lose them. So I headed down across the border to Glacier National Park, a place I'd always wanted to visit. Being from Alberta, I'd seen plenty of beautiful mountains in our national parks of Banff and Jasper, but I wanted to go and visit the state and see the country down there. I was also interested in the Museum of the Plains Indians over in Browning, near the east side of Glacier. There, on the Blackfeet Reservation, as I've always had a curiosity about how the early indigenous people lived. So, off I went. I first visited Waterton National Park, just across the border from Glacier. Then I crossed into the state on Chief's Highway, which goes right by Chief Mountain, a sacred site for the Blackfeet. Most of the east side of Glacier borders the Blackfeet Reservation with the town of Browning not far away. So I decided to first go to the museum there. It was well worth the drive, and I really enjoyed all the displays about the early indigenous people in the area. One display really stood out. It was about the edible and medicinal plants the Blackfeet used. It was quite extensive, and I stood there for some time, studying what plant you could use to heal yourself. I had no idea that some of these very plants would soon be on my own survival menu. Being a nurse, the topic of medicinal and edible plants was interesting to me as I could see how people might use them when injured or lost. I decided to look into it more when I got back home and see what I could learn. I laugh in retrospect at how life can be so ironic. I was becoming interested in something that would soon help save my life, unbeknownst to me. 
I next decided to visit that part of Glacier National Park known as Many Glacier. Since I was already on that side of the park, I had my camping gear with me and managed to get a sight at the campground, which was first come, first served. It was mid-August, still a popular time in the park, so I felt very lucky. I paid for three nights, talked with the campground host for a while, then set up my tent and proceeded to make myself a nice dinner of lasagna I'd bought earlier at the small grocery store in Browning. Along with a nice salad and a cup of tea, I recalled that meal many times in my mind's eye later, desperately wishing for just one bite. Even though the campground was nearly full, everyone was quiet, and I spent one of the nicest nights of my life there, first sitting in my camp chair watching the stars unfold above the high mountain top, then finally crawling into my roomy tent and falling asleep on my comfy sleeping pad in my new sleeping bag. It all felt luxurious, which may sound strange since I was camping, but you have to remember I'd been living in a trailer, in an oil patch man camp, with nothing but noise and people coming and going. I felt like I'd found paradise. The next morning, I relaxed again in my camp chair, eating a breakfast of scrambled eggs and toast, all cooked over my little Coleman stove. I again kind of luxuriated in my good fortune at being there. Little did I know it would be the last meal I'd have for some time. Many Glacier is central to a lot of nice hikes, and I studied the map, deciding to hike to nearby Fisher Camp Lake. After putting together a day pack, I next made a grave mistake by going to the campground host and paying for another four nights, making my stay a total of a week. Why was this a mistake? Well, it pretty much guaranteed that no one would miss me for some time, as I was all paid up. If I'd left it at three nights, the host would have noticed. I'd overstayed my reservation and contacted the rangers, who would then send out a search party. As it was, I'm sure they thought I was just out hiking leaving early and getting back late, thinking nothing of my absence. So off I set to hike to nearby Fisher Camp Lake, just a short distance on a fairly easy trail. I'd been told there were a lot of moose there, and I thought it would be fun to get some photos. I hadn't been hiking a lot, so I wasn't in the greatest of shape, and I figured I'd start out slow. This trail would be perfect, as I could just cruise along, then come back to the campground and be lazy. I was soon at the lake, hiding behind a stand of willows, watching a young moose stick its head under the water and come up with a mouthful of vegetation. A couple came and stood nearby, and we got to talking quietly, so as not to disturb the moose. They told me I should hike on up to Red Rock Fall, which wasn't much further and was worth the trek. It was only 1.8 miles from the falls to the parking lot, and I was already partway there. I wasn't a bit tired, so I decided to go on up there. A number of people were on the trail, which made me feel safe, as I knew solo hiking in Glacier wasn't advertised because of bears. In retrospect, it was kind of ironic at how cautious I was being, like someone from a city, not someone from the deep woods of Canada where there are lots of bears. The trail was still easy, and I was really enjoying the hike. It didn't take long to get to the falls, and I decided it would be a great place to spend the afternoon, much better than down at the campground. The views of Mount Grinnell and the other massive peaks were enough to entertain me for hours. I made myself comfortable, leaning against a rock, watching a ground squirrel collecting grass for its winter supply. Then I promptly fell asleep. I guess the trip and activity was wearing on me, or maybe I'd finally realized I was on vacation and could really relax. When I woke, the last traces of sunset lit up the high peaks above me, and the shadows were long, telling me I should be on my way. I was now alone, everyone else having the sense to get back before it got dark. I grabbed my day pack and water bottle 
and headed back the way I'd come, knowing I needed to hurry or I'd soon be hiking in the dark. Now everyone should always carry a headlamp or flashlight when they're out hiking, even if it's just a short trek. And I know that now, but let's just say it was something I learned the hard way. I didn't do any hiking up by Fort McMurray, where the oil sand camp was, for it was thick timber and muskeg with nowhere to go. I was now nearly running, trying to beat the light when I must have snagged my toe on a root or something, because before I knew it, I went down. I fell forward, and I instinctively tried to catch myself with my hand. I knew instantly I'd made a mistake, for I felt both wrists snap at the same time. I immediately knew both wrists were broken. Ironically, I treated a guy a year before for the same injury. He caught his foot on the edge of a trailer and gone down and done the exact same thing, shattering his wrist. It had been a painful time for him, and he ended up on leave for four months, unable to do much of anything until he healed. I sat there in a state of disbelief, then began examining my situation in a kind of detached way. My hands were at a 45-degree angle to my arms and were swelling rapidly. I could still wiggle my fingers, and there were no bone protrusions, so I hoped it wasn't as bad as it felt. As I lay there on the trail, I knew I had only a small time frame before the pain would become severely and possibly even incapacitating. I needed to get myself up and get help before I went into shock. I had to get back to the parking lot which was near some cabin and a motel. Have you ever tried to stand without using your hands? It's extremely difficult, especially when you're in the middle of a trail with nothing to wedge yourself against. I tried and tried using my elbows to try to lift myself up, but each time I felt like I was going to pass out. I finally realized I was going to have to scoot over to the edge of the trail where I could brace myself against a tree. I managed to scoot along on my rear, but I misjudged the edge and rolled right off the trail down into a stand of huckleberry bushes. I managed to hit one on my wrist on something in the process, and the pain was so intense I must have passed out, for I don't recall anything until I woke up in the middle of the night moaning. It took some time to recall where I was and what had happened, and I don't remember a lot about that night except that my hands and wrists had become so swollen I couldn't move them at all. I could no longer even wiggle my fingers, and the pain was intense. I now wondered if I wasn't going to die from hypothermia as I was shivering. I miraculously made it through the night, though I remember falling into a fitful sleep off and on, waking occasionally and wondering why I didn't just die and get it over with. It seemed ironic how quickly my happiness at being there had turned into tragedy, and what seemed like my own imminent death. Okay, my first mistake was not having a light, and my second mistake was misjudging the edge of the trail. But I was now about to make my third mistake, which was even worse than the first two. As it became daylight, I was finally alert enough to realize what was going on. I tried to crawl back up the trail using my elbows, but it was too painful as well as too steep. When I realized there was no way I was going to get back on the trail, I should have stayed where I was and yelled when I heard people go by, and I'm sure I would have been rescued within hours. But instead, I decided I needed to get down by the stream and put my hands and wrists in the cold water to reduce the swelling. I recalled that when the oil sands worker had broken his wrist, the first thing I'd done was wrap them in bags of ice, which helped with both the pain and the swelling. So, scooting myself down to the stream was my third biggest mistake. For once down there, no one could hear me yelling, because of the sound of the nearby falls. I'd initially been close to the trail where someone might have heard me, but now my chances were zero. I realized this after I was down there and my thoughts had cleared. 
the pain being relieved somewhat by the cold water, in fact. The water was so cold, I had to be careful to not actually freeze my wrists and hands, taking them out every so often. And I also realized that I'd gotten myself to where I not only would never be heard by anyone, but also where I'd never be seen because of the stand of huckleberries. I'd gone from the proverbial frying pan into the fire, and the only good thing about it was that I could now get the swelling down as well as lean over and drink from the stream, lapping up the water like a dog. I then realized I'd made mistake number four. I'd left my pack above on the trail where I'd fallen, the same pack that had trail mix and fruit and a couple of sandwiches. But I finally decided it didn't matter, as I wouldn't have been able to open the pack to get to the food anyway. As the day wore on, I yelled and yelled, hoping someone would hear me. But the roar from the falls was just too loud. Red Rock Falls is actually a series of small falls, so the noise is consistent and continues for some ways. All that day, I drifted in and out of consciousness from the pain. And when I was feeling lucid enough to recognize what was going on, I would drift into an inconsolable sadness, wondering if anyone would ever find my body so close to the trail, yet so far. I would sometimes think about my family, my friends, my past, and all my future dreams. My hopes of going on to a Doctors Without Borders mission to help sick people, things like that. After what seemed like many several cycles of day and night, I was beginning to feel weaker and weaker. I knew I needed food, but I also had no appetite, which was probably a good thing as there was nothing to eat anyway. I knew if I was in better shape, maybe I wouldn't need my arms to stand. But I tried everything, from wedging myself against a tree to even sliding around on my rear end to a small rise, where I used gravity to help me get on my leg, but promptly fell back down, almost again hitting my wrist. Finally, I recall waking one morning to something pushing its wet nose on my face, then opening my eyes to see a fox, of all things, it looked at me with what I interpreted as sad eyes, maybe wondering why I was there. By then, I'd given up all hope and wishing death would come and get it over with. But seeing the fox's shining eyes and silky coat filled me with wonder, and I knew it was aware I was in trouble. For some reason, that little fox left me with a renewed will to live. Well, I could add more, but I think you get the picture. I later figured out I'd been there about four days when I had what I call the dream, though I don't know if it was a dream or if it really happened. If it was real, I barely even saw who or what visited me. I'd yelled so much I was forced and had a sore throat, and like I'd mentioned, I was getting very weak, though fortunately I had plenty of water. Humans can live for three or four weeks without food, so I'm told, but only a few days without water. So, I was lucky to be near the stream. If you want to call sabotaging myself by rolling up the trail, any kind of luck. Finally, despairing of trying to deal with the constant pain and unable to get myself up off the ground, I finally just kind of lost it. I went into a tirade about how I didn't want to die like this and how it wasn't fair for someone who dedicated their life to helping others to die without help and on and on. This was followed by a round of yelling and sobbing and just letting it all go. I then settled back and suddenly felt at peace with everything. I guess I'd gone through denial and then on to acceptance at that point. I drifted off and when I woke it was dusk, though I'm still not sure I was actually awake and it wasn't just a dream, or maybe I was hallucinating. But there, in the evening shadows, I saw a huge form coming toward me, pushing its way through the trees and bushes. As it got closer, I could feel my hackles go up, for it looked like a huge grizzly bear, larger than anything I'd ever seen, even in the Canadian bush. It was hard to tell because of the lack of light, but I could finally see it wasn't a bear, after all. But it was walking on two legs and had a human-like face. 
Now this large creature came to my side and bent over, holding out what looked like a small, flat pancake. I was, of course, unable to take it, and I just looked at it questioningly, afraid to move. It was close enough that I could see its face was covered with dark skin, and its eyes were really big and liquid-looking. He, or maybe it was a she, I don't know, then put the small cake up to my lips, as if wanting me to eat it. I took a bite, and it was really crusty, but as I slowly chewed it, it actually tasted pretty good, though it had a somewhat bitter aftertaste. I slowly ate the entire thing, and I imagined the creature looked pleased, though I could barely see it. It then turned and left. I immediately went into a deep sleep, and when I woke, it was daylight. Miraculously, the pain had lessened, and it looked like the swelling had gone down. Then I noticed a small pile of what looked like raspberries nearby. Not being able to use my hands, I finally managed to scoot over next to them and basically lick them up. Again, like a dog might do, I've never had anything taste so delicious, and I found out later they're called Loganberries. I then scooted back to the stream and put my wrist back in the cold water for a while, then slept. That evening, again at deep dusk, the creature returned with another of the cakes. It again held the cake for me as I ate it, and it was then that I realized the bitter taste had to be salactic acid. The main ingredient in aspirin and what relieves pain, fever, and inflammation. I've since learned that willows and other plants naturally contain salactic acid and were used extensively by the natives for treating pain and swelling. The creature also had some huckleberries, which it slowly fed me. As it did so, I tried to study it more closely, but it was so dark it was hard to see much. It then walked around behind me, and for a brief moment I was scared what it might do, but it gently picked me up and carried me back up the trail. I was certain it would leave me there, but it didn't. It actually carried me all the way back to the parking lot. By then it was pitch dark, and there was no one around. It took me to the steps of one of the nearby cabins where it gently put me down. What it did next, I'll never forget. Stepping back into the trees, it let out the most horrific howl I've ever heard. It was so loud, I wanted to put my hand over my ears, which of course I couldn't. I could now hear people inside talking, and I started yelling at the best of my ability, which wasn't very loud as I was so weak, but I guess it was loud enough for they tentatively opened the door and upon seeing me, helped me inside. I knew then that the creature had slipped into the trees and was gone. Everything after that is kind of a blur, though I do remember going to the emergency room where the ER staff quickly carried me to a bed, hooked me up with saline and morphine, wheeled me to an x-ray room where they took multiple x-rays then knocked me out to straighten and splint both wrists. When I woke, I had no idea who I was, where I was, or what had been done, which I think was a good thing. I spent two weeks in a rehab facility, then went to stay in an apartment in Calgary my company rented for me, where I had constant care for several months, until I could use my hands again. It was a long, slow, frustrating process, but fortunately, there was no permanent damage. I eventually returned to work where I started studying medicinal plants in my free time. There's a lot more to the topic than one could learn in a lifetime, and I eventually quit my job to go study with some of the indigenous people in Western Canada, writing a book about it in an effort to help preserve their knowledge. I now live in Whitehorse in the Yukon, where I again work as a nurse, but also work with the natives to try and preserve their heritage and culture. There's not a whole lot more to my story, except that I sometimes wonder why the creature didn't take me to the cabin when it first found me, but instead waited a day. Maybe it thought I could go on my own after eating one of the cakes, or maybe there was something else going on, like a bear on the trail. I'll just never know. I just feel very fortunate it helped me. But I still sometimes wonder if I didn't somehow rescue myself and dreamed everything else up. It's just hard to imagine something like that actually exists, I guess. 
And now, when I sit and look out into the Yukon wilderness, I'm not afraid. But my whole perspective has changed. I guess you could say my sense of the mundane has been replaced by a sense of wonder. For I now know there's more out there than we could ever understand. And I guess that can be a good thing, depending on one's perspective. I know it turned out to be a good thing for me. A very good thing. On to the next one. It started when I stepped out of the bar and nearly stepped on a badger. No, I hadn't been drinking, and I doubt if it had either, unless it was drinking river water. It was 1 a.m., and my sister and I had just closed everything down. Our little pizza bar here caters to the college crowd, so it's sometimes a lot of fun. Sometimes not, depending on what part of the semester it is. Ironically, finals week is when we do our most business. The week after finals is usually good, too. I guess the same kids who blow it up by procrastinating at the bar come back to drown their sorrows. But generally, the kids are nice. And we only serve beer and pizza, so it doesn't get too crazy. But that particular night, I stepped out of the bar and almost stepped on something alive, and it barely dodged my foot. I know I would have squashed it. I shined my little keychain pen light on it and couldn't believe it. It was a badger. I ran back in and got Josie, my sister, but by the time she came out, I could see it trying to hide over under a small bush in the alley. We walked over and took a better look. Yup, a badger, a very young one. My mom once wrote a cute little story for her fourth graders called Badger the Gooder, but I knew badgers aren't very good. They can be mean little things, so we steered clear of it, wondering what a badger was doing in the middle of town. Neither of us had ever seen one. While wondering why a badger had come into town, we noticed flashing light a few blocks away. A lot of flashing light. Something was going on down by the river. I decided to drive by there on my way home, just out of curiosity. And what I saw was a real bummer. The river was rising, and a bunch of people were sandbagging the houses along the riverfront. Police cars and fire trucks were lighting everything up for them, and everyone looked tired and frazzled. I sometimes forget that 1 a.m. isn't a normal time to be awake for most people. I decided to stop and see if I could help. I offered to bring our big coffee machines over if they could find a place to plug them in, and I called Josie. We were soon in business, running out of someone's garage. We supplied free coffee and pizza for everyone sandbagging, and Josie and I were busy until the next day, when we had to go home and get some sleep. Last I looked, the river was still rising, and was almost to the sandbag. That explained the little badger. Its home was washed out, and it was seeking higher ground. I felt bad for it, and hoped it had found a new home. The next afternoon, on my way down to the pizza bar, I swung by the river to see how things had fared, but I couldn't even get down there. The road was closed, and I could see the floodwaters coming right up into the next street. It appeared all the sandbagged houses had been evacuated and probably flooded, in spite of everyone's effort. It had been raining for days, and though this was something the town had experienced before, it had been a number of years ago. The town had been built along the big muddy river where it served as a headquarters for the timber mill that worked the big log the loggers would send floating down from the thick forest in the mountains above. The mill had long since closed, and the little town was now home to a small college or it would have died off a long time ago. There wasn't much anyone could do at this point except evacuate their home if they lived near the river. The rain was forecast to get more intense. It was a 100-year flood, they were saying, but I noticed it hadn't been that long since the last big flood, maybe only 10 years. It seemed like these big floods were getting more and more common, and we'd had a small one just last year. There were police and fire vehicles all over the place, and I was now worrying 
if the river might actually come up to where we were, as it was now only a couple of blocks down from us. I stopped and asked a guy who looked like a firefighter what he thought, and he said if the rain continued, it just might flood us out. It wouldn't hurt to be prepared. So I went to the bar and told Josie what I'd seen and heard. We decided to go ahead and open up and just kind of wait and see what happened. We stood to lose a lot if the place flooded, as there was no way we could move our big pizza oven or expensive espresso machine, not to mention tables and chairs and all that. And of course, we didn't have flood insurance. Nobody did. It was too expensive. One just took their chances. We barely made enough to live on as it was. We had plenty of business that afternoon. It seemed like everyone was all excited about the flood. Part of the campus was down by the river, and it had been cordoned off, though it was mostly ball fields and such. The rest of the campus was open for business, though the kids speculated what parts would close first if the river kept rising. They seemed to be kind of enjoying the excitement and were placing bets on what buildings would flood. The drama department looked like it could be one of the first to go, and a few drama students were having a pizza and beer while planning how to evacuate the costumes and equipment. We were on lower ground than most of the college, so I was paying attention to the report the kids brought in, believe me. But one report was a bit out there. One of the kids, a, stu a student named Sarah, came bursting in saying a bear was stranded out on a bunch of flotsam in the middle of the river. She was all excited and wanted to do something to save it. It was wet and bedraggled looking and needing help. This spurred a big discussion on how it would be impossible to rescue a bear from a raging river except by helicopter, followed by various theories on how to do it. You could tranquilize it, then tie it to a gurney and lift it into the chopper, but what if it woke up early and all that? It was a pretty interesting and creative discussion, but Sarah finally gave up and left, possibly looking for real help. I decided to go check it out, see if I could spot the poor bear and also see where the waters were. I was pretty worried about our bar and I guess the bear too. I drove on down to the city park, which was along the river, or I should say was now under the river. I parked and got out along with a dozen or so other people standing on a small hill above where the park used to be. Sarah was there, so I asked her about the bear. She pointed to a jumble of trees and logs that had snagged on a big rock in the river, and sure enough, there was something black out there, hanging on for dear life. Some of the others were watching it too, and voiced their concern. Someone should help that poor bear out there. How the hell could you help it? It would be a death wish to get on the river. Maybe someone could throw a rope. You'd need a 50-foot rope or more, and how would you get it out there? How would a bear hang on to a rope? And on and on. Sarah and I stood there together, feeling bad for the bear. I told her I wished I could do something for it. She agreed. She added, it's kind of odd looking. I was checking it out through my binoculars. I'm not actually convinced it's the bear. I was shocked. What else could it be? I asked. I think it's a young Bigfoot. She kind of whispered this to me, not wanting anyone else to hear, handing me her binoculars. It was hard to make out, but it was clinging to a big log that was snagged by another big log against a bunch of tree branches, all caught on a big rock in the middle of the river. The whole thing looked like it could go at any minute. I tried to see what the young animal looked like, but had no luck. But then it turned its head a bit and I could see its face. It looked like a young person out there, but someone with hair on its face and a flattened nose. But it was not a bear. It looked tired and frightened. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Sarah, if you're right, were looking at an endangered animal struggling to survive, especially if it's a young one. I know, she answered plumply. We have to help it. We just have to. Look at how big the river is. It's huge. There's no way you could get a boat out there, and that's the only way I would know how to help. Plus, it's a wild animal. It wouldn't know what was going on and would probably flee, drowning. Sarah's answer surprised me. 
I guess she knew a lot more about Bigfoot than I did. Bigfoot's smart. It would know you were helping it. It wouldn't panic. It wouldn't hurt anybody. We've got to get out there and help it somehow. I'm game, Sarah, if you can figure out a way. Come on over to the pizza bar if you do. Right now, it looks like it's pretty much stuck at where it's at for a while. But if the river gets much higher, it's going to wash everything off that rock it's snagged on. Maybe the animal can swim to shore. I don't know, Sarah replied, looking like she was about to cry. What if one set out upstream in a boat and steered it down to the snag where the Bigfoot could jump in? Would it do it? You'd have to be nuts to get on that river right now. Don't even think about it, Sarah. One big log and you'd be history. And I doubt if the animal would jump in anyway. And it would only have a minute to do so, so then you'd be swept past it, or maybe snagged there too. Sarah sighed. You're right. I guess I need to remember that serenity prayer that says to change what you can and accept what you can't. I need to quit being such a bleeding heart. See you later. I sensed the determination in Sarah, and I suspected she might be thinking about trying something really foolish to save that animal. Not much I could do about it, but I hoped I was wrong. One last look at it, and nothing had changed. It was still hanging on for dear life. It was dusk, and the river would rise during the night if all this rain kept up. I doubted if it would be there when dawn came, but I had the pizza bar to focus on. So I drove back up there and got back to work. About midnight, a firefighter came in and told us we had to evacuate. The river was coming up fast. We had thought about what we would do if things happened, but we still weren't prepared. We started hauling off the stuff we could, the smaller things like the cash register and dishes. The students who were there really pitched in and helped, and I promised them all free pizza if the bar survived. A couple of them drove pickups, and when we had everything that we could get out, we took everything over to the house and unloaded it all. It was a stinking feeling to stand there in the rain in the middle of the night, looking at all we owned possibly being ruined, even though we had put tarps over it and brought the smaller things inside. I somehow figured we were soon in for a career change. Sure enough, the bar flooded that night. Our beautiful pizza ovens were covered in black river mud the next time I saw them, and the big espresso machine was gone entirely, maybe floating on down to the ocean. I couldn't help but wonder how the little Bigfoot was faring. Its plight somehow made me more appreciative of my own situation, dire as it was. All we stood to lose was our livelihood, but the little animal stood to lose its life. It seemed sadder than seeing all our stuff lying wet on the ground. I slept a little that night, but the excitement was too much, and I was up at dawn. I was worried about the little animal, whatever it was, and I wanted to see if it had made it through the night. The way the river had risen, I was doubtful. I drove on down to the park. The flooding was even more extensive now, and the river seemed to be rising even more. It hadn't abated any at all. It was still raining. In fact, it was raining so hard I couldn't really see if the flotsam snag with the little animal on it was even still out there. I went to check on the bar. I should have been more worried about it than the animal, as I somehow knew it was history, and sure enough, it was. I couldn't even get near the building. The flooding had covered blocks of the downtown, and the bar was a good three blocks in. The police had everything cordoned off. I knew the water had to be deep and the damage extensive. I was glad we didn't own the building, but just rented. Our only loss was the equipment, at least. Others had lost much more. I felt kind of shell-shocked. I went back home, telling Josie about everything. The town was continuing to flood. The city had now asked people to open their doors to others as the shelters were full. And it was still raining. I tried to nap but I knew they needed help downtown sandbagging and evacuating. But my heart wasn't in it anymore. I just wanted to get away from everything. I think, in retrospect, that I was in a bit of shock. I told my sister I was going for a drive out in the country to get away and wouldn't be gone long. She understood. She had been cleaning what we'd salvaged from the bar and was in shock herself. I drove out past the park on into the forest. 
down toward the big clear-cut area where the mill had stored logs, and then onto a little road that led out to where someone was building a vacation home. I had to stop when the pavement ended, as the road was nothing but mud from all the rain. I just sat there by the side of the road, thinking about what had happened. I was still worried about that little Bigfoot, wondering if it had survived when a plan came to me. Old mill towns have lots of history, and our town was no exception. Some of that history included a big cable that had once been used to cross the river before a bridge was built. A small boat was attached to the cable and pulled across. That cable was still there, although the boat was long gone. Why couldn't we rig this up and get a boat out to the little animal? Whether or not it was smart enough to get into the boat was another question, but at least we would have tried. I guess deep inside, I was a bleeding heart just like Sarah. I turned around and went back toward town. How could I find Sarah? I had no idea where she lived. I would just have to make the plan work without her help and inspiration. But first, I needed to see if the little animal was even still there. I drove back down to the park. I guess great minds think alike, because Sarah was there, along with a dozen other students, and a small boat bobbed out by the flotsam's nag, attached to the old cable. She had been miles ahead of me, and she'd managed to pull it off. Everyone was standing there in suspense. Would the animal get into the boat? Sarah saw me and smiled, and I decided it was a waste of time to tell her I'd had the same idea, so I just gave her a high five. She handed me her binoculars, and I had the pleasure of watching the animal climb into the boat. I reported what I saw, and everyone cheered. I love college kids. They're so enthusiastic, and nothing stops them from doing what they want. They're too young and inexperienced to know they can't do something. They just go ahead and do it anyway. The boat had ropes attached to pull it along the cable, and the plan had been that. If the young Bigfoot did get into the boat, they would pull it across to the other side, opposite town, so it had a chance to get back into the forest. Would it stay in the boat while they pulled it across? Would the current be too strong for them? The boat started slowly moving across the river, flapping against the waves as it went, the little animal staying put inside. Everyone held their breath as Sarah, who now had the binoculars, reported on the progress. The boat was now safely on the other side, there were a bunch of college guys over there pulling the boat in, and they stood back allowing the animal to jump out and flee. They later reported it was the mangiest bear they'd ever seen, and had a weird face. I don't think they had a clue what they'd helped rescue. The little Bigfoot ran like a banshee for the forest, and quickly disappeared, while everyone on my side of the river cheered. I congratulated Sarah. She was now calling it a bear, and I think she decided to not say what it really was. She just wanted to see it rescued and then be left alone. I admired that. We both knew it was best for the animal. The rain finally stopped, and the town eventually recovered, taking weeks to clean everything up. Our espresso machine was found in the neighbor's building and actually still worked after we cleaned it up. Our landlord cleaned up the building, we cleaned up our oven, and two months later, we reopened the pizza bar. We had a new menu item, Sarah's Bigfoot Boat Float, which is the biggest and best root beer float you can get anywhere. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!